And as we've come to the last Sunday of this year, the subject on my heart is Jesus came to remove the root of sin. Jesus came to remove the root of sin from within us. And I'd like to read a verse in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10 which says, The axe is laid to the root of the tree. These are the words of John the Baptist. He was introducing the ministry of Christ as his forerunner and the way he said it was the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Up until that time, people were under the old covenant in Israel and there was no axe laid to the root of the tree. The law could only prevent people from sinning on the outside. The commandments prevented people from committing murder, adultery, but it was all within. There was murder and adultery in people's hearts, but they could not bring it out like in the rest of the world because they had a law which said you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. They would be punished. So we could say the law was like a pair of scissors that cut off the fruit as soon as it is about to come out of a person. So it prevented it. But the root lay within all those years. And that's why it says the old covenant had to be abolished. And a new covenant had to be established when Christ came. And one of the great blessings of the new covenant and the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is that the axe can now be laid to the root of sin in our lives. And that is God's will for every one of his children. And as I've observed God's children in many parts of the world, it's always been a grief to me and I wondered why is it there's so little spiritual progress in so many of them? Why is it that so many are defeated by the same old sin year after year after year, you go through a whole year, come to the end of the year, and you're still defeated by the same old sins they were defeated by 10 years ago. It's like children sitting in the kindergarten class forever and ever and ever, never seeming to learn how to add 2 plus 2 or 3 plus 3. Would you be concerned if your children had a problem with addition or reading simple words like BAT or CAT year after year after year? That would be a serious problem and it would concern you. And I want to say it concerns God when he sees his children defeated by the same sins year after year after year. And I believe the reason is the root has never been hit. We're always using the scissors to cut off the fruit as soon as it comes out. So <clears throat> when we think of the root of sin, I want to go back to the beginning of time, before time, when first God created the heaven and earth, Genesis 1 verse 1 when there was no sin at all. And we want to try and see how did sin first come? Because there we can find the root. And we read in scripture that God, before, long before he created man, he created numerous angels, millions and millions of them. And he created one as the head of all the angels. We don't know his name. His name is not mentioned anywhere in scripture. But we know he fell from that position and became Satan. And when he fell, he pulled down perhaps one third of the angels with him. And they are the demons who go around the world today. But they were all good angels once upon a time. And Satan was the perfect angel. What, he was the one through whom sin first came into the universe. And that's written in scripture for our instruction. So that's what I want to show you. First of all, in Ezekiel, in chapter 28, we read, there are two chapters, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, where we read of how Satan fell, how he was an angel and he fell. And I want to show you Ezekiel 28, where he's described in verse 12. Say to the king of Tyre, and the one behind the king of Tyre was Satan. Satan was behind evil authorities on, authorities on the earth, controlling them. And that's why he says, speak to the king of Tyre. It's like sometimes when casting out a demon from a person, I have to speak to the demon who's inside that person. Like Jesus would speak to a demon inside a person. Speak to this king of Tyre and say to him, 
Thus says the Lord God, you are the seal of perfection. Ezekiel 28, 12, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That could never refer to a human being. It was a demon who once had the seal of perfection. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And it says in verse 17 of the same chapter, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. In that sentence, you see the origin of sin in this perfect universe that God has created. It didn't come through adultery, it didn't come through murder. It came through pride. A pride that is invisible, it was in the heart, only God could see it. It's so important to see this. This is what corrupted this earth into the mess that is in today. When one angel became proud of a beauty that he had not produced, but which he had been gifted by, by God. In a moment, that angel became a devil. His heart was lifted up because of his beauty. And it says he corrupted his wisdom and by reason of his splendor. There were three things he was proud of. His beauty, his wisdom, and his position. And his pride in his beauty and his position and his wisdom made him an, a devil in a moment. And the same thing can happen today. When we become inwardly proud of something which God gave us. I mean, even if you've accomplished something great in the world as a scientist or a businessman and made a lot of money, don't forget that it's because God gave you intelligence and health that you could do it. You could have been born mentally challenged or with some other ailment that would have prevented you from ever accomplishing whatever you did accomplish. So it is a gift of God. We must never forget it. And when we become proud of that and begin to think that I'm somebody or I accomplished that, in a moment, a person who's like an angel can become like a devil in God's eyes. He may cover that up from people for a long time so that people don't see it. But if the root of sin is not hit, if we don't allow Jesus to deal with that, we will never make progress. Year after year after year, we'll be the same. So this is one area where it's good for us to examine ourselves as we come to the end of a year. Have we grown in humility? Do we look down on others who we feel are not as clever as we are or not as good looking as we are or not from the superior race that we are from or some such conceited stupidity that we have in our mind which the devil puts into our heads that somebody is not so clever, not so smart, that somebody is dumb. You got to let the Lord deal with the root of sin in your heart otherwise you can claim to be a Christian but you'll remain in the same level in the kindergarten all your life. This is the truth. This is the reason. Jesus came to lay the ax to the root of the tree. Never be satisfied, my brother, sister, with scissors that clip off the fruit that you have a good testimony before men. That's what made the Pharisees into Pharisees. They were satisfied that people thought they were good, religious, holy people. It's a deception. And there are plenty of Pharisees today. Now from that pride, you see the result of it. In Isaiah 14, is the other chapter where we see, remember it started with pride in the heart and that pride made him say some things in his heart. Isaiah 14 and verse 13. It's again speaking about this angel who became the devil. You said in your heart, again it was in the heart. All sin begins in the heart. Jesus said out of the heart comes forth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts. Everything comes from within. Proverbs 4, it says, keep your heart with diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You said in your heart, I will ascend. He wanted to go up above. He was already on top of everyone else, but he wasn't satisfied that he was a leader. He wanted to go even further, exalt himself in the eyes of others and become someone great. I will ascend. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the Mount of Assembly. This is the thing which has to be hit in us, the desire to go up over others, to lord it over others. And 
instead of being a servant of others like Jesus came to show us. Now I want you to see something else here. This I will, self-will, I will, I will, I will. And you see in the next verse, verse 14, I will, I will. Here is where sin began. In pride in the heart that it makes a man says, I want my will. That's what leads to conflict between a husband and wife and both say, I want my will, I will, I will. That's the will that Jesus crucified in his life. I want you to see that in John chapter 6 and verse 38. John chapter 6 verse 38 is the one sentence autobiography of Jesus' life. We have four biographies of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But John chapter 6 and verse 38 is Jesus' description of his own 33 years. Here is a one sentence description of what Jesus did in 33 and a half years. The opposite of what we read in Isaiah. Satan said, I will ascend to heaven. Jesus said, I come down from heaven. Satan said, I will make my throne like the most high, I'll make like myself like the most high. But Jesus did not consider equality with the Father something to be held on to, but gave it up and came down. The reason I'm pointing out these two contrasts is for you to ask yourself, me to ask myself as well, which spirit motivates me in the decisions I make, in the thoughts I have of myself? Is it that which wants to ascend above others, show that I'm superior, get a following for myself, or to descend and serve others, to come down? Is it a question of asserting my will or saying like Jesus, not my will? All through his life, he never did his own will. That's how he hit the root of sin. He was tempted, we read in Hebrews 4.15, exactly as we are in every point, but he did not sin. He was tempted to do his own will. We see that clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed, not my will. I want to do this, Father. I don't want to drink this cup, but not my will. However painful it may be, I will deny my will and I will do the will of my heavenly Father. That was the secret of Jesus' life. So there's pride that led to self-will. And the third thing I want to say is the spirit of rebellion. The angel, this highest angel was under the authority of God. And there was only one authority above him. That was God. But he didn't want an authority over him. He said, I don't want any authority. I'm not going to submit to any authority over me. That's why he said, I will make myself like the most high. This is a third characteristic that you find that Satan has infected the human race with from the time of Adam. Pride, self-will, and rebellion against authority. That's what happened to Eve. When she took part of that tree, she was acting in pride. I know better than God what's good for me. I know God said, don't eat of this tree, but I know better. That's pride. Self-will, I know God's told me not to it, but I want to do it. And I will not submit to God's authority over me. I will not even submit to my husband's authority over me. I don't have to consult him. I'm going to take a decision on my own. This is what brought sin into this world. Satan succeeded in infecting man with the same pride and self-will and rebellious spirit that he himself had. And there's a fourth characteristic of Satan that Jesus described in John chapter 8 and verse 44. John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. Jesus spoke the truth even if it hurt and you can see it in these words. Can you imagine a preacher standing up before people and saying, your father is the devil. This is the meek and mild Jesus that the world celebrates at this time. You are of your father the devil, he told the Pharisees. He was a doctor 
who would not touch up the scan if the scan said the patient had cancer. He came here to deliver people from sin, but he pointed it out first. You're of your father the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. You see how when man is infected with the poison of devil, of the devil, he does those same desires the devil has. That's why I wanted to point out to you the things that the devil made, the, what made him the devil. And if we can see that we've been infected by that, when Paul says, in my flesh dwells no good thing, this is it. He was a murderer from the beginning. And then the last part, it says, when he speaks a lie, that's the other characteristic of Satan, lying, dishonesty. He speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. I don't know whether you all realize how serious it is to tell a lie, to give a wrong impression to people, to cover up something that we did wrong by lying instead of honestly acknowledging I was wrong, that was wrong what I did. It's been there from the beginning of the human race, even when God asked Adam, did you eat of the tree? All he had to say was yes or no, but he beat around the bush and said, well, it was really my wife, and don't forget that you gave me this wife, and she gave me, and I ate it. You know, this is beating around the bush instead of honestly confessing his sin, like the thief on the cross, who said, I'm guilty. I deserve this. And the Lord said, well, you're fit for paradise if you acknowledge your sin, because I came to die sins. It's a wonderful thing when we confess sin, not to blame anybody else, not to blame our wife or anyone else. Say, Lord, I'm guilty. Those are the people fit for paradise. So we've seen there those characteristics in man. I want to just show you two examples, one from the time when the old covenant was initiated and the other after the day of Pentecost. In Exodus 32, we read of the time when the old covenant was being initiated on the Mount Sinai, when, on Mount Sinai when Moses was up there talking to God. And while he was up there, this weak leader, Aaron, who was only interested in personal popularity, he made an idol, a calf, to get people to worship and said, this is Jehovah who brought you out of Egypt. And when Moses came down, he was so angry and he asked Aaron this question, what did you do? And see what Aaron says. Exodus 32, verse 24. He says, I asked these people to give me all their gold, and they gave it to me. And I just threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> wow, what a miracle that was. It was lying. This man was supposed to be a leader equal with Moses and he was a liar he was unwilling to acknowledge his sin in the new covenant in the day of Pentecost after the day of Pentecost what is the first sin that God judged in the early church again lying I want you to turn to Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 we read of a time when people were so zealous and they were, there were many poor people among them. They sold their property in order to help the poor. And there was one man who wanted the honor, among others, of being known as a wholehearted Christian who also sold his property and gave it for the poor, but he didn't give it all. There was nothing wrong in keeping it back, but he wanted the honor of being one with the others in sacrifice. And when he came in line and laid the offering at the feet, he never said a word. And as he was walking away, Peter called him back. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to tell a lie? See how when Satan comes into a person's heart, he makes him lie. Do you know that when you tell a lie, Satan's filled your heart? It's like we read, he's the father of lies. But you can't have a child with a mother, without a mother. And Satan wants you to be the mother. He'll be the father. But I want a mother. And he's looking around people. He looks around believers. He looks around Christian leaders. Will you be a mother? I want to tell a lie. Why have you, Satan filled your heart to tell a lie? 
The first sin mentioned in the Bible, the first sin is lying. Genesis 3, verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely shall not die. Genesis 3 and verse 4. That's the first sin that you read of in scripture. It wasn't adultery, it wasn't stealing, it was a lying. Satan told a lie. The last sin mentioned in the Bible, Revelation 22 and verse 15, outside the city, Revelation 22 verse 15, are the dogs, the sorcerers, think of what type of evil all this is. People who were, do witchcraft and immoral persons and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves telling lies and who practices telling lies. That's the last sin mentioned in the Bible. Isn't that interesting? That the first sin and the last sin mentioned in the Bible is lying. You read about Aaron, the leader, lying in the time when the old covenant was being established. And after the new covenant being established, the first sin God judged was lying. Ananias didn't open his mouth when he came up with that gift. He just quietly left the gift and went away. And Peter said, you're told a lie. A lie is not just something we say with our mouth. When I give people an impression which is not true it's a lie I can beat about the bush with speaking so many words but if I've conveyed an impression which is false it is a lie Satan has got in somewhere so when we look at these four things that characterize Satan that we have just looked at pride that's where it started wanting my way self will my will my will my will stubbornly sticking to one's will and thirdly rebellion against authority and fourth lying these are the things Jesus came to hit down at the root of and if you want to know how serious rebellion is let me show you another verse in the first book of Samuel sometimes we don't see the seriousness of these sins See, we are, we are familiar with the sins that the world considers serious. If I were to ask you to make a list of what do you think are the four most serious sins? Would any of you have thought of these four that I mentioned? I think most of us would have written murder and adultery and stealing and whatever is the fourth one you, you can think of. But that's the list that a worldly person would also make if you ask a worldly unconverted person what do you think of the most four serious sins he'd say murder adultery theft in other words the standard of many Christians is not much different than the standard of people in the world because they haven't read the Bible they haven't seen what is it that brought sin into this universe first of all what is it that Satan is trying to put into people's hearts in 1 Samuel 15 we read of a time when King Saul rebelled against God and in verse 23 Samuel said to him rebellion is like the sin of divination or as the King James Version says witchcraft when God says something and you don't do it it's rebellion God had told Saul go and kill all the Amalekites and all their cattle he killed everyone except the king he killed the bad sheep but kept the good sheep. It was a very small thing in human eyes. He did not obey God completely. Samuel came to him and said, God's taken away the kingdom from you because you've been doing witchcraft. Witchcraft? Yes. Rebellion is like witchcraft. When God says something and we don't do it, that's called witchcraft. It's serious. Now, there's a contrast when we look at Saul and David. David was a person who fell, humanly speaking, into some gross sin. We all know of David and Bathsheba. But what we don't know is that David was a person who never rebelled against authority. As long as God didn't give him the throne, even though Samuel anointed him at the age of 20, he had to wander around in caves with Saul chasing him but he never grabbed the throne for himself even one day when Saul was at his mercy sleeping in a cave 
And David's soldier said, kill him now. David said, no, I won't touch him. God wants to give me the throne, he'll give it. And God was so appreciated that, that he called him a man after my own heart. He doesn't grab things for himself. I've been in Christian ministry for 50 years now nearly, and I've seen so many people who seek to grab a ministry for themselves, who try to push doors open saying, I want to be here, who want to ascend in the eyes of others. That's not the spirit of David. That's not the type of thing God looks for in a man who's supposed to represent him. Jesus never did that. Jesus never went around looking for a ministry. He never wanted to people to think that he's a great healer. When he healed the sick, he would usually tell them, don't, don't tell anybody, I'm so happy you're healed. I don't want everybody to know I'm a healer. Just go quietly and thank the Lord. So different from people who call themselves today preachers and who claim to have a healing ministry. And if you see that, you need to see that that's not Christ. That's not the way Jesus lived on earth. That's not the way he healed the sick. And Jesus never went around with, with an offering bag after he healed the sick. It was so different from what we see healers doing today. We need to see that. There was a spirit in Christ which is completely different from people who claim to represent Christ today. And there's hardly anybody exposing it. Jesus lived in submission to the will of his father when he was on earth. Now the question comes. People say, well, it's easy to submit to the authority of God. But you know, God has placed authorities on the earth who are his delegated authorities. And if you don't submit to God's delegated authority, you're not submitting to God. That's what we read in scripture. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 6 and verse 1, children, let's start with that because that's where we all begin and we who are parents have to deal with that with our own children. Children, obey your parents for this is right. Verse 2, honor your father and mother for this is the first commandment with a promise. God gave 10 commandments and only one commandment with a promise. And that promise is in verse 3 that you will go, it'll go well with you. So, what is, it the, what is the first thing that God wants parents to teach their children? To submit to authority. Not the authority of God, because they don't know God. The only person they know as an authority in their home is their parents. And if we teach them to submit to the authority of parents, we have dealt with that root of sin which is in them from the time they are born. There's a spirit of rebellion, of self-will in every one of our children. And you see that pretty soon manifest. And if we don't cooperate with God in bringing that in subjection, we're gonna have a problem in our home and gonna create problems for society when our children leave our home. God has appointed delegated authorities in their home and when a child rebels against his parents he's rebelling against God the only authority that child knows as I said is a parents and that's why it's so important for parents to represent God to that child in a loving way to be firm and loving we got to be firm because there's a corrupt nature in that child we got to be loving at the same time because they got that corrupt nature from us <laughs> so that's why we need that balance you can't blame them. So th this is the balance. Behold the kindness and the severity of God. God is a kind and a strict father. And a father and a mother who represent God will be kind and strict. But they must recognize that they are God's delegated authorities for their children. And the reason why there's so much chaos in society today around the world is because parents have failed in their responsibility to bring up their children before in God's ways. That's why the Bible says, that's why the Bible says that if a man doesn't bring up his children right, he's not fit to be an elder in the church. I took that seriously when I had, I have four sons and I said, Lord, if I don't bring up these sons right, I'm not gonna preach. If I can't bring up four sons right at home, 
How am, going, how am I going to lead 100 or 200 people in a church? Completely out of the question. If I can't teach four sons at home to live in godly ways, how am I going to lead 100 or 200 or 1,000 people in God's ways? It's so very, very important. Delegated authority is God's authority. It's the same in society. God's appointed authorities in society. You read in Romans chapter 13. In Romans 13 we read in verse 1. Let every person. He's talking about Christians. Be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. He's talking about society. He's talking about a Christian must behave in society. How you must respond to a traffic police pulling you up to the side of the road. Or how you should respond to any government authority in your country asking you to pass a law. And verse 2. Therefore, he who resists authority. Not talking about God now. He's talking about that delegated authority. Is actually opposing the ordinance of God. And you will receive condemnation upon yourself. That means God considers it seriously when you resist an authority whom he has appointed. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, because this authority is a minister of God, a servant of God to you for good. Imagine calling a secular, unconverted policeman or <clears throat> secular authority as a servant of God. So the Bible says. And further, you see in verse 6, because of this you pay taxes for rulers are servants of God. Have you ever thought of the IRS as servants of God? <laughs> Have you read your Bible? <laughs> we pay taxes because they are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. And you know they devote themselves pretty thoroughly to this. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is, God has established order in this universe. <clears throat> That's why you don't find the planets colliding with each other. There's order. There's a particular orbit in which the earth is supposed to move in a certain speed. A particular orbit in which Mars and Venus and Uranus and Saturn are all supposed to move around the sun. And they've never violated that law of God. There's an order that God has placed in the human race. Authorities, parents over children. Governing authorities in society. In your office, your boss is the authority. And Jesus has given us an example in his home. We read in Luke chapter 2 how Jesus submitted to authority. It's a very interesting verse. We read in Luke chapter 2 that when Jesus came back from the temple at the age of 12, Luke chapter 2 and verse 51, he went down with Joseph and Mary, came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. Why did a perfect boy have to continue in subjection to imperfect authorities? Joseph and Mary were imperfect. They were not even in the new covenant. They hadn't even come to the day of Pentecost to be filled with the Spirit. They were old covenant people, good people, but like many good parents today, defeated by sin. The best parent in the world is defeated. There's no parent in the world who's done it perfectly. I've tried to be a very good father and I, I've never been a perfect father. God had mercy on my children and that's why they're all following the Lord today. But it's not because of any perfection in me. Joseph and Mary were not perfect. And here was a perfect boy who had never done anything wrong watching his imperfect parents. Maybe yelling at each other. Maybe telling him things which are unreasonable. If he had disobeyed them once in those 30 years, he would have sinned. And he would not have been a perfect sacrifice on the cross. To raise Lazarus from the dead was an easy thing. He had to speak a word. Lazarus, come forth. But to submit to imperfect authority for 30 years, to me, that is the greatest miracle that I see Jesus did without sinning. 
once. You think it's easy for a little boy to obey his parents? You ask your son whether he finds it easy. You ask your daughter. Whatever their age. It's not easy. It's not easy when they're six. It's not easy when they're 10. It's not easy when they're 15. It's not easy when they're 20. And Jesus was at home till 30. He continued in subjection to them. He taught us thereby. Why did he do it? Because he was subject to the authority of his father. Father, if you want me to submit to imperfect authority, I'll accept it. And there was a reason for that. Because every authority on earth is imperfect. And if that could be an excuse for us to disobey, then Jesus had more excuse than any of us. Because we're not perfect, we're imperfect ourselves. We imperfect people complain such a lot about imperfect authorities. And Jesus, the perfect person, never complained about it. He only wanted to know, what is the Father's will? My Father has determined that I should be born into this home. I wish children would realize this. It's God who determined the form into which they are to be born. We need to teach them that, to be subject to authority. That's the root of sin. Jesus came to hit it so that we can train and raise up godly children for the Lord and godly people for society so they can be a blessing in society as well. But there we can point them to the example of Jesus. All our children, think how Jesus did it. Dad and mom may not be perfect, but Jesus showed submission to imperfect authority as the pattern for Christians. And that's why we can submit to imperfect authority in society. It doesn't make a difference whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Whoever is the president, you've got to submit to him. That's submission to authority. And for you to sit and speak evil about authority is no different from your children sitting at home and speaking about evil about you as parents. You may not agree with them. And I believe it's perfectly all right if we, can, if we express our disagreement. But to speak evil... The Bible says we should never do it. Because that's rebellion against authority. Let me show you that in the book of Titus. In Paul's letter to Titus, he says, Titus chapter 3. He speaks about our being justified. Turn, turn with me to Titus chapter 3 verse 1. Remind them, chapter 3 verse 1, Titus 3 1. Remind people, he says, to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to, to be obedient. Now, remember, who was the ruler in Rome those days? Nero, the wicked emperor Nero. You couldn't find a worse man than him. Remind people to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. And verse 2, to malign none of them. You can disagree with them, but don't malign them. To be peaceable, gentle. This is how we show that we are Christians. We recognize authority. We are subject to authority in our home, in society. For example, none of you would think of rebelling against your boss because he's imperfect. Most of us work with bosses who are unconverted, who probably do a lot of evil things, immoral. But in your office, you submit to them. Because that's the only way you can get your salary. <laughs> and why don't we recognize that in other areas? God has appointed authorities in the home, authorities in society, and here's the difficult part, authorities in the church. There are elders God appoints in churches. Always plural in the New Testament who are to lead the church. I know because I spent 40 years of my life planning churches in cities, in villages, poor people, in some villages where there was no church or Christian for 2,000 years. We planted churches and we have appointed elders, just like you read in the Acts of the Apostles. And we have taught them to be subject to those elders because the Bible says that. Why is it that Parents are very insistent that their children should submit to their authority at home. Why is it we are ready to submit to our bosses in the office? 
Why is it we are ready to pull up to the side of the road when the traffic police pulls us up? But so reluctant to submit to eldership in the church. It's because of the spirit of rebellion that's not been completely eliminated from us. I'm speaking as one who has practiced what I've preached. There are numerous churches with which I disagreed when I was younger. I grew up in an orthodox church, very similar to the Roman Catholic. And as I understood God's word, I left it because I felt it was not following scripture. Then I went to another and I found there was also some things not according to scripture. I, scripture was my guide. And that's how many of us have moved from one church to another and come here. But one thing I did at each step, I said, I'll never cause any problem here. If I leave, I shall leave quietly. I shall not leave as a rebel. I shall never rebel against authority. I would be gracious to them. I remember the last Baptist church I left because I preached the baptism in the Holy Spirit and they didn't like that. I said, fine. God bless you brothers. I shall quietly leave. I shall never ask anybody else to leave with me. And that's how we started our church in our own home. But when we started in our home, three or four of us were meeting together and I told them, I want to say one thing here. None of you must ever speak evil about that Baptist church or its leaders because they threw me out. No. We're going to love them. If we see them on the street, we're going to submit to them and love, not submit to them. We're going to love them and bless them. We're going to spend our time judging ourselves here in this church because there are lots of things wrong with us still. We're not like Christ. And let's work on that instead of trying to work out somebody else's salvation. And do you know, God blessed that attitude in us that we have grown from that little group that we were to around 50 churches around the world and many thousands of people who come to Christ because we decided we're going to judge ourselves. We're going to submit to authority. We're going to respect. If we disagree with someone, we're just going to quietly leave. But we're not going to create problems. My dear brothers and sisters, let me tell you from experience that if you go that way, God will bless you, wherever you are. So that's the example that Jesus has manifested to us. And I want to show you one more thing. In the way Jesus submitted to circumstances that happened to him. For example, we read in one place that Matthew chapter 12, that people call Jesus Beelzebul, the prince of devils. Now that's a strong word to use against one who is a son of God. I mean, even if you respect him as just an order, you don't call people prince of devils and things like that. Some people recognize him as a prophet. But you know Jesus' reaction to that. He said, have you spoken a word against the son of man? You're forgiven. I asked the Lord once, I said, Lord, what do you, why did you always call yourself the son of man, son of man, son of man? And the way I understood it was Jesus was always trying to say, I'm an ordinary man. Really? He was almighty God on this earth. But how did he conduct himself as an ordinary man? And what he was saying is, have you called an ordinary man like me, the prince of devils? You're forgiven. I saw that, it broke my heart. I said, Lord, make me like that. Till the end of my life, let me recognize I'm an ordinary man. Almighty God walked on this earth as an ordinary man, as a servant of others. He was born in a stable because there's no one could be born lower than that. I've never heard of any baby being born in the midst of cows and donkeys in a cow shed. Why, was he, why did he choose to be born there? He who planned his birth from all eternity could have found a better place to be born. But he chose that because he wanted to come underneath everybody. He had to die for our sins. He came to earth for that purpose. But why did it have to be such a shameful death on the cross? Couldn't he have died in a more decent way for our sins? Instead of being stripped and humiliated and stripped almost naked and hung up. There was no need for all that. But... Even in his death, he wanted to come underneath everybody so that nobody could ever turn to him and say, Lord, you don't know what I've gone through. Nobody could be born lower than him. Nobody could be die worse than him. And even when he was a child, he walked around Nazareth. And you know how it is in the villages. I know how it is in the villages of India. Everybody knows about everyone else in a small village. 
everybody knew that Mary became pregnant before she was married. Who would believe that the Holy Spirit was the one who produced that child? Nobody. They laughed at her. And they would make fun of Jesus as he grew up. That little boy, you see him there? Nobody knows who his father is. He grew up with that stigma throughout childhood so that nobody could ever say to him, Lord, you don't know what I'm going through. I want to say to all of you sitting here, I don't know what you've gone through or what you're going through, but I want to tell you that your Savior has gone through it before you. He's been tempted in every point as you and I are. He came underneath us. He didn't want to ascend like Satan. He wanted to descend. On the last day of his earthly life, he was washing the disciples' feet. That's the type of authority he wanted. Not to lord it over people. How different it is in today's Christian circles with people who want to lord it over others. Is that the right representation of Christ? When Jesus came to earth, he came with a purpose. And one of those purposes was to reveal to, God, to this world what the Father was like. We read in John's Gospel, chapter 1. No one has seen God at any time. John 1, 18. No one has seen God at any time. But the only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Jesus explained the Father because the Pharisees had portrayed such a wrong picture of God to people. They had portrayed God like a policeman who was waiting to catch them or a judge who was out to punish them. And Jesus came and said, that's not, God is not like that. He's a loving father. And he explained it so perfectly in the way he put his arm around the lepers and washed the disciples' feet and traveled long distances. Sometimes we read he traveled all the way 50 miles to Tyre just to heal one Canaanite woman's demon-possessed daughter and walked 50 miles back. I remember reading that and I said, Lord, walking 100 miles? To help one person? Is that how you serve the Father? Make me like that. Make me sensitive to the Holy Spirit. This is how Jesus lived on the earth. And he said, this is what God is like. God has got the spirit of a servant. And at the end of his life, he could tell the disciples, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And he told his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I send you to a world that does not know what Jesus Christ is really like, to a Christendom that does not know what Jesus Christ is really like, I want you to go there and show what I'm really like so that people look at you and you can say, if you have seen me, you've seen a little bit of what Jesus is like. If you've seen the way I speak to you, you know a little bit of how Jesus would speak. If you've seen me the way I behave in my home, You'd seen a little bit of what Jesus is like. My dear brother, sister, have you seen that? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to hit the root of sin in your life? To get rid of that pride and that rebellion and that wanting your own way? Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself every day. Take up your cross and follow me. This has been the challenge that's come to me. Now maybe we haven't understood all this in these past years, but we're beginning a new year now. And I want to encourage you to choose this way, which I call the way of the cross, the way that Jesus chose to say no to self, no to that spirit of rebellion, no to that pride that makes us compare ourselves with others and look down on others, and allow the Holy Spirit to change us gradually into the likeness of Christ. Romans 8, 29, I'd like to show you this verse. Romans 8, 29 says, God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. There's a destination written on our tickets. Like when you travel in a flight, it's written on the ticket from San Francisco to New York. There's a destination. There's a destination God's put for you on your ticket. You know what it is? It's not heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say our destination is in heaven. That's what preachers have told you. It's not in the Bible. Your destination is to become like Christ. That's the goal towards which God is working. And you need to ask yourself as you come to the end of this year, whether you come nearer to that goal. Can your wife say, 
You become a little more like Christ this year. Can your husband say that? Not perfect, where none of us have become fully like Christ, but a little more. It's like going from the first grade to the second grade. We haven't understood everything there is to study, but we've moved on to the second grade, to the third grade. We should be moving on a little more Christ-like at the end of the year. This is always the prayer with which I greet people over a new year. I say, I hope at the end of this next year you'll be a little more Christ-like, a little more like Jesus, a little more closer to your destination which God has written on your ticket. That is God's will. And that will not happen unless you take seriously to allow the Holy Spirit to hit the root of pride, of wanting your own way, of rebellion against authority, and of lying, pretending. I'm not asking you to confess your sins to others. No, we must confess our sins only to God. But don't pretend to be more spiritual than you really are. That's lying. To give people an impression. Hate it. It was hit at the root of sin. I remember the days, when I younger days, I used to be asked sometimes to pray in public. And you know how it is when we pray in public. We are more conscious of people than of God. And I would pray, and I'd go home and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I was only trying to impress people with that prayer. I wasn't praying to you at all. Forgive me. I judged myself. And the next time I got to pray, again I found the same thing. And I, but I was determined to fight this. I said, Lord, I'm going to come to a time in my life, it takes me 10 years, I'll get there, where when I pray in public, I'll be praying to you, Almighty God, my Father in heaven, not bothered whether people are listening to me or not. I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters, some of you who pray in public, ask yourself, is that the way you pray in private to Jesus? If not, ask yourself, aren't you trying to impress people? Is that the way you're supposed to pray? Do you ever judge yourself on that? I'm not asking you whether you're perfect. I'm asking you, is it a little better this year than it was last year? That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking whether you've got your PhD. I'm asking, have you moved out of first grade to second grade at least? Have you moved on? Is next year going to be the same as this year? Or are we going to move on? One last word. In Ephesians chapter 6, this is a word the Lord gave me many years ago when the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit. There's something else the Lord showed me. You must stop fighting with human beings. Ephesians 6, 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against all these evil forces of darkness. That's a choice I make in my life. I, that's what the Lord showed me. You either fight with human beings like the Israelites did, the Philistines, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Syrians, this, that, and the other. They never fought with the devil in the Old Testament. Not even the great prophets. But the moment you come to the New Testament, you find Jesus, the, lead, the mediator of a new covenant, the head of the church, never fighting with human beings. If they called him Beelzebul, he'd forgive them. They called him a Samaritan, which was a racist remark in those days. He forgave them. They said he had a demon. He forgave them because he would never fight with human beings. He fought with Satan. And he set an example for us. And what the Lord showed me was this. If you want to overcome Satan in your life, and that's what we've been talking about in this subject, in this, in this message, you've got to first determine that you will stop fighting with human beings. Seek God for the power of the Holy Spirit to completely finish with fighting with your wife at home, fighting with your husband at home. Stop it. Stop fighting with your fellow believers. Seek the way of peace. Pursue peace with all men. I've tried to follow that for a number of years now. And what is the result? I've got authority over Satan. What the Lord said to me is, as at one time, you were afraid of Satan. Now Satan will be afraid of you. That's the way you are supposed to live, my brother, sister. We are supposed to have authority over Satan. We are supposed to fight him. Save your ammunition to fight the devil. Don't use it against human beings. Let's turn around, make a decision in the new year. We become, at the end of our life, the sum total of all the little decisions that we have made in our life. 
At the end of this year, you have become the result, the sum total of all the decisions you made in your past life till today. Make sure that in the coming year, those are right decisions. Lord, whenever I find pride rising up, I'm going to follow you in the way of humility. Whenever I find self-will, I'm going to say, not my will, but thine, Father. Whenever I find rebellion against authorities coming up, I'm going to submit. And whenever I find a tendency to lie or give a wrong impression, I'm going to fight and speak the truth. And I'm never going to fight with human beings. Lord, give me grace for that. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we pray there will be some decisions taken here which will have permanent effects in the lives of many, many people, hopefully everyone, that will make us completely different people by the end of next year. We know that things don't change in one day, but we believe a lot can happen in one year. We pray that we shall see our goal, press on towards it. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.